Good afternoon and welcome to Data Arts latest in a series of, of new tech focused online events. Today's topic is intelligent automation, the logical extension of RPA. Now let me introduce our two presenters for today. Alex Bronstein, Principal Consultant based in New York, focused on intelligent automation and other key technologies. And Brian Jenkins, Senior Solution Architect, also US based. Alex. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us today uh, to learn about uh, intelligent automation. Uh, my name is Alex Bronstein. Um, I will kick things off uh, with a big picture overview of intelligent automation, uh, and then we'll delve into uh, various uh, automation technologies. Along the way, I will provide uh, some illustrative uh, examples of projects uh, we have uh, done uh, at Data Art in the um, intelligent automation area. Uh, then I will uh, turn it over to Brian, uh, who is going to talk about how to get started uh, with intelligent automation uh, in your organization, uh, how to be successful, and um, uh, how to scale automation across your organization. So uh, what is intelligent automation um, and why, why is it such a hot topic these days? Uh, intelligent automation is most commonly defined as uh, robotic process automation enhanced with artificial intelligence. Um, so basically RPA with the brain. Um, at Data Art, uh, we look at it more broadly, uh, but uh, more on that uh, in a bit. Uh, intelligent automation uh, has been an important part uh, of digital transformation that's been happening for the better part of the last decade. It has been helping companies uh, meet uh, many of the new expectations uh, of the digital era. But given what has happened uh, in the world over the past several months, uh, intelligent automation is going to take an even more prominent role uh, in digital transformation. Uh, COVID-19 crisis uh, will turbocharge um, and accelerate digital transformation. Uh, there are still so many legacy business processes uh, that involve uh, paper documents and face-to-face -face interactions. All of these processes uh, will be transformed, reimagined, uh, and digitized over the coming months and years. So success at intelligent automation uh, is going to play a big role uh, in uh, uh, determining uh, which companies will succeed and which ones will fail uh, in this new environment. What is intelligent automation? Uh, at DataArt, uh, we define intelligent automation as the intelligent application of a broad range of technologies, uh, both modern technologies like RPA and artificial intelligence, as well as more, um, more traditional IT technologies to business process automation. Uh, why do we prefer this uh, broader definition? Uh, first of all, there is more to intelligent automation uh, than uh, RPA and artificial intelligence. Uh, we also include under the umbrella of intelligent automation technologies such as uh, business process management systems, uh, blockchain, uh, and process analysis tools such as process and task mining. Um, also, you cannot forget about all the IT systems uh, that exist uh, in any organization. The main reason why most of these systems exist is to automate business processes and transactions. This includes uh, core business applications uh, it uh, that are used by employees internally. It includes all of the digital channels uh, such as web, mobile, and uh, chat APIs that are used by by customers, by partners, uh, and by suppliers. Uh, it includes data and infrastructure that uh, uh, supports all of these systems. All of these uh, uh, existing systems are going to be part of any future automation infrastructure. In fact, uh, I would argue that the greatest gains uh, from automation can be achieved not by implementing RPA, but by creating and enhancing digital channels. If your company is behind on digitizing its interactions with external stakeholders, uh, that's probably where you should focus uh, your automation efforts. If you're looking to re uh, really transform your business with intelligent automation, uh, you have to look uh, beyond our RPA or any one technology. Uh, you have to begin by defining uh, your business objectives and then uh, design a solution uh, that best achieves those objectives. So what are some of the benefits of intelligent automation? Uh, when people think of uh, automation, the first thing that comes to mind is a cost reduction. 
uh, how many uh, how many employees can I uh, can I eliminate? Uh, but uh, if you ask most of uh, business and IT executives, they will not put cost reduction at the top of the list. Uh, it is important, and many organizations have achieved uh, significant cost savings uh, with intelligent automation. Uh, but there are many other uh, uh, priorities uh, and benefits. Um, intelligent automation can result in significant improvements in quality, in speed, and in customer satisfaction. Um, automated processes uh, are less prone to human error. Uh, they are performed faster. Automation of time-consuming, uh, repetitive manual tasks uh, can free up workers' time uh, to focus mo on more value-added activities uh, and on the customer. Automation can significantly improve job satisfaction uh, for the human workers uh, and uh, reduce turnover. And uh, greater job satisfaction, as everyone knows, leads to uh, improved quality and uh, improved customer service. Intelligent automation can also improve availability auditability uh, and security, among uh, uh, a number of other benefits. Now let's take a deeper dive uh, into different technologies of intelligent automation. We will start with uh, RPA because it is the most popular and widely used of the modern technologies. But I want to caution right away that while RPA is a powerful technology and it has a place in uh, any organization, uh, it has a number of drawbacks and limitations. It can automate business processes, but it cannot really improve and transform business processes, even when it is enhanced with uh, artificial intelligence. If you want to fundamentally improve and transform business processes, uh, you have to look beyond RPA. So what is RPA? RPA uh, is software that allows a person to configure a so-called software robot, um, basically a, a program that uh, can perform the same types of tasks that a human being can perform using a computer. Uh, RPA robots can uh, log into applications, uh, enter data into uh, applications or extract data. They can manipulate files uh, and work with uh, all types of desktop software. They can read emails, uh, then they can execute a series of rule-based tasks. Uh, they can perform loops and conditional logic and many other things. Uh, RPA robots can can be used uh, in an attended fashion, um, basically launched by a user, or they can be used uh, in an unattended fashion, running on a server and launched by a scheduler or um, as a result of some system event. Why is RPA such a popular technology? It is, it is a very lightweight technology. It works uh, uh, on top of existing infrastructure and business applications. Uh, it is much quicker uh, to implement uh, RPA automations uh, than to re-engineer existing systems and processes. So it is much cheaper uh, and it provides um, a much quicker payback than um, uh, many of the other automation approaches. RPA robots uh, can work with any type of system, uh, including modern web-based applications, as well as legacy desktop and terminal-based mainframe applications. RPA bots can make... Uh, API calls. Um, in fact, when a system has an API, it is always best to have the bot uh, use the API rather than interact with the system via a user interface. RPA can work uh, with artificial intelligence tools uh, and unstructured documents, but we'll uh, talk more about that uh, in the next section. What types of processes uh, are well suited for automation with RPA? Uh, processes that are rule-based, uh, uh, processes that don't involve a lot of judgment, uh, processes that operate uh, more on structured data than unstructured data, although RPA is becoming increasingly better at uh, working with unstructured data. High volume processes that involve a lot of FTEs that are prone to human error, those types of processes where you will see the greatest return on your investment uh, and uh, the shortest payback period. Uh, the leaders in RPA space are uh, UiPath, uh, Blue Prism, and Automation Anywhere. But as you can see from this picture, it's uh, quite a crowded space. If you haven't uh, started experimenting with RPA and uh, trying to decide uh, which system, uh, which uh, product to go with, you probably can't uh, go uh, wrong with any of the uh, top three uh, providers. So what are some of the pitfalls and limitations of RPA? As I mentioned earlier, one of the key reasons why RPA is such a popular technology uh, that it's lightweight and works uh, on top of existing systems and infrastructure. This is also um, a weakness of this technology. Uh, when RPA 
automates an inefficient process, uh, it results only in marginal benefit. Um, one way to think of RPA is as another type of uh, end-user application. Uh, end-user applications usually exist because uh, of the functionality gaps uh, in core business applications that inevitably develop uh, as business needs change. So by layering RPA on top of existing core business applications, uh, as well as end-user applications, uh, can increase complexity and fragility of processes. When RPA has to heavily rely on working with legacy UIs, uh, it can become uh, quite brittle uh, because changes uh, in UIs, especially changes in external systems, um, uh, are difficult to control and anticipate. Sometimes RPA speeds up uh, one part of a process and that just moves a, a bottleneck to another part of the process. Uh, this is a problem when, when you apply RPA to a process without first rethinking and re-engineering it. Because of all these issues, the actual returns in RPA investments are sometimes lower than they um, uh, they may be expected. Now let's uh, let's turn our attention to the technologies that put um, uh, the word intelligent uh, into intelligent automation, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. AI and ML technologies replace uh, or supplement. Uh, uh, human cognitive functions uh, with machine intelligence, uh, and this makes them great candidates uh, for use in automation. There is no one way to classify these technologies, but uh, from the point of view of business automation, I find it useful to divide them into three categories. Uh, intelligent document processing uh, deals with converting uh, information found in documents such as emails, forms, uh, uh, reports, et cetera, into structured format. Um, natural language processing uh, deals with understanding human language, uh, whether it is written uh, language or spoken language, and uh, extracting meaning and intent from that language. Conversely, uh, it deals with uh, converting structured information into spoken or written language. Um, this is the technology behind chatbots and uh, the uh, um, uh, intelligent assistants that are familiar to everyone, like uh, Alexa and Siri. Uh, cognitive insight uh, refers to the ability to find patterns in data uh, and build models that can make predictions uh, based on that data. Uh, all three categories of these technologies are used uh, widely in automation, uh, but uh, today we don't have to, time to talk about all of them. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, intelligent document processing, which is a technology that probably receives uh, uh, the greatest share of attention uh, when it comes to automation. So despite all of the progress uh, that we've made uh, with um, automating uh, uh, business processes and transactions, uh, documents, uh, paper documents are still everywhere uh, in every industry and in every business function. And uh, much of the manual effort uh, in any process is spent reading uh, and analyzing documents uh, and extracting data from documents. Here is just a sample of different uh, processes across several industries uh, that uh, are still heavily reliant on paper documents. One of the advantages and reasons uh, why intelligent document processing is so popular is that it's uh, a relatively accessible technology. It doesn't require uh, uh, building, uh, often it doesn't require building custom solution. Uh, when developing uh, intelligent automation solutions, specifically um, intelligent document processing solutions, uh, you basically have three options, open source solutions, uh, so-called machine learning as a service solutions, and software as a service solutions. Open source solutions are on one end, end of, of the spectrum. Uh, they come with uh, prepackaged libraries uh, and models for intelligent document processing, which helps you jumpstart uh, your project. These solutions uh, offer you the greatest flexibility and control of your project. Uh, they can be uh, easily implemented uh, directly into your existing applications. They're also free, which is uh, always nice. Uh, on the flip side, uh, they require qualified specialists uh, to implement solutions. And uh, these programs uh, are not trained on uh, very large volumes of data. So uh, out of the box, they may uh, not work very well. The recognition quality may be uh, fairly low. If your company has to work with particularly complex and non-standard documents, or you have a very high volume process that requires very low error rate, 
uh, this is probably the approach you should take. Software as a service solutions, uh, on the other hand, are completely out of the box. They come with um, easy to use APIs uh, and uh, they uh, require little if any specialized knowledge. Um, they, they are pre-trained on large number of typical documents, such as invoices, loan applications, etc. cetera. Um, they should work well for many of the simpler um, and more standard use cases. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, you have to continue paying for these uh, when they're in production. Uh, and they're also uh, not very customizable. Uh, machine learning as a service solutions kind of fall somewhere in between um, the two. They're easy to use and deploy. Uh, they're pre-trained in a lot of data and they can be customized to some extent. They can become expensive as you have uh, an ongoing um, expense when they're in production, um, just like the SaaS solutions. If you're contemplating a project uh, that involves uh, intelligent document processing, you can try uh, SaaS solutions first. If that doesn't work, uh, try uh, machine learning as a service solutions. Uh, and then if you can't achieve the results that you want, uh, move on to uh, open source solutions. A good example uh, of an intelligent automation solution that combines RPA and intelligent document processing uh, is a project we recently did for a consumer finance company in North America. Uh, this company is a leader in financing of home improvement projects. Uh, they provide financing through a network of builders uh, and home improvement contractors. Uh, one of the project's goals was to automate uh, the validation of loan contracts. Um, as part of loan origination, uh, uh, the company needs to make sure that the information in the loan contract matches the information that was submitted by the builder uh, through their online portal uh, uh, and make sure that no information is missing and uh, that the contract is uh, signed properly. Uh, we had already been using uh, UiPath uh, RPA software to automate many of the company's business processes. Um, but we found that uh, IDP tools provided by UiPath uh, didn't work very well for this particular problem. They did not provide a good recognition quality for the types of contract documents uh, this company was using. So we had to come up with a uh, custom solution that integrated multiple tools. Um, this is actually quite typical of intelligent automation projects. Uh, you often need to try a number of different tools uh, to put together a solution that works. The solution we ended up putting together combined five different tools. UiPath as a, an overall automation and orchestration tool, three different uh, tools from AWS, uh, TextTract, Recognition, and SageMaker, and, and uh, some custom development with Python. Textract was used to uh, extract data from documents as, as key value pairs. Uh, recognition was used to uh, determine if a uh, document was properly signed, that uh, signature box contained uh, uh, handwritten text. Um, and uh, SageMaker was actually used not as an ML solution, but more of a front end for internal staff to validate uh, uh, the data that was extracted from, from TextTract, uh, using TextTract. Uh, and then uh, Python script was uh, used uh, to uh, extract uh, the signature box and serve it up to the recognition service. Um, so uh, the lessons from, from this uh, example are that it is possible to automate part of a business process that usually involves human cognitive functions, uh, and you need to be creative and try a number of different tools to arrive at a solution that works. Now, uh, let's uh, turn our attention to business process management systems. Um, this is a much older technology. Uh, they've been around since early 90s, I believe. Uh, business process management systems are still very much in use today. Uh, and uh, still very much uh, relevant. So business process management systems play the role of an orchestra conductor uh, in a process, in a business process. Uh, they assign uh, which employee, which uh, external user or system should act uh, at every step in the business process. They ensure that every piece of information uh, that is generated and exchanged during a process is tracked from the beginning to end. Uh, some of the dominant players uh, in the BPMS space are Pega Systems, Appian, uh, IBM Business Process Manager, and um, uh, Komundo is, is a relatively new company that provides uh, more lightweight uh, uh, and componentized and flexible uh, BPMS tools. Uh, BPMS uh, uh, get uh, sometimes get a bad rap uh, for 
their complexity uh, cost and steep learning curve, but uh, there are now uh, lower cost, uh, more lightweight, and uh, even open source solutions uh, available, and Kamunda is an example of that. And despite some disadvantages, BPMS should definitely be considered uh, as an option for automating complex, high-volume, uh, business-critical uh, processes. Uh, sometimes uh, people ask, what, you know, what is the difference between BPMS and RPA? Um, the main difference is uh, in the focus. Uh, so BPMS are focused uh, primarily on re-engineering and streamlining uh, high-volume end-to-end uh, core business processes, uh, while RPA is more fo focused on uh, task automation. BPMS have a much higher business impact, uh, require much um, greater implementation effort, uh, require more uh, changes to the existing systems and re-architecture of uh, existing systems, uh, also much more costly uh, and um, take quite a, a bit of time to learn. Uh, BPMS uh, can be used uh, together with uh, RPA and, and uh, uh, many companies combine the two. So BPMS is used to orchestrate uh, different steps in the business process, uh, and then RPA is used to automate uh, all the different tasks uh, within each step of that business process uh, that's controlled by uh, BPMS. Now let's uh, talk about blockchain, or um, also known as uh, distributed ledger technology. Uh, Blockchain, DLT, and smart contracts are terms that uh, don't often come up in conversations about intelligent automation. However, these uh, technologies uh, are very well suited for a specific type of automation problem, automation of complex uh, manual multi-party workflows between uh, non-trusting parties or at least parties that need to independently verify uh, every transaction and every piece of data that flows through a process. Smart contract, if you're not familiar with what they are, uh, basically programs that run on top of blockchain systems. Um, so if we look at some of the functions of uh, a smart contract, they, they're used to define multi-party workflows, uh, they define business rules uh, for processing transactions, uh, they determine how data is shared between parties, um, uh, they are responsible uh, for tracking uh, states of a transaction. So uh, if you look at these functions, uh, you realize that uh, these are pretty typical functions uh, of a business process management system. So, uh, so blockchain and smart contracts can be thought of as a BPMS uh, for multi-party workflows. Look at a project where uh, a distributed ledger technology was used successfully to automate a multi-party business process um, this was a project uh, in reinsurance space. The company uh, we worked with is a market leader uh, in reinsurance of pension uh, pension plan risk uh, or so-called pension risk transfer. Pension plans buy insurance from insurance companies to protect their beneficiaries in the event that a pension plan's performance falls outside of set boundaries. Um, insurance companies in turn uh, offload some of this risk uh, to reinsurance companies. Uh, the process uh, involves multiple insurance and reinsurance companies, uh, as well as, as the pension funds. Uh, and the single uh, insurance contract can cover tens of thousands of individual uh, pension and annuity policies and be uh, enforced for as long as 50 years. Um, the business process uh, involves uh, monthly updates of the data related to tens of thousands uh, of policies that underlie the insurance and reinsurance contracts. Um, and the updates to the resulting payment obligations between the insurance uh, and reinsurance companies. So prior to the implementation of blockchain solution, um, all of the administration work was manual and uh, it involved exchanging data and spreadsheets via email uh, between multiple parties. Uh, each party had to maintain an uh, internal system of records for managing the data performing payment calculations uh, and for reconciliation. Uh, it was a very manual process, a very time consuming, uh, involving a lot of uh, many FTEs, so very expensive as well as error prone. Um, blockchain technology offered uh, the best solution to this problem as it supported creation uh, of, a, of a single source of truth about the data underlying the insurance contracts. Uh, and. Uh, uh, all uh, participants can have a copy uh, of that uh, single source of truth um, 
and they can verify instantly uh, the accuracy of the data. Also, all the internal uh, administration solutions uh, were replaced with one platform uh, that is used by all parties. Uh, so this has led to significant uh, process efficiencies. Um, it improved the reliability of the process, and also it is saving all the participants a lot of money on uh, maintaining um, individual IT systems that they previously had to. Uh, so this case study illustrates that blockchain technology has a great potential for automation of uh, multi-party workflows. Um, it also illustrates that uh, achieving transformative results uh, uh, requires uh, truly innovative and uh, transformative solutions. So now let's uh, look at a relatively new category of tools um, uh, called process analysis tools. Um, all, all the technologies that we discussed so far are technologies that are used uh, for automating business processes. Uh, process analysis technologies help you understand your processes uh, before you actually automate them. Um, and then once they're automated, uh, they help to continuously control and monitor your processes. Process uh, analysis and modeling uh, has traditionally been a, a very manual process. It involves uh, interviews with uh, uh, process participants, uh, observations, uh, and analysis of various uh, artifacts uh, of a business process. It involves uh, drawing lots of flow charts uh, that sometimes can only be understood uh, by the person who, who drew them. So it is very uh, inefficient and it often misses what's actually happening uh, inside a business process, um, all the exceptions uh, to a typical business process. And the artifacts of this process very quickly become outdated. Uh, so uh, the new way, uh, the new uh, process analysis tools, uh, they um, address uh, this problem. Uh, they help visualize uh, and analyze processes based uh, on data collected from the actual actions performed during a process. Uh, they are data-driven and they provide uh, unbiased and uh, actionable insights. There are two uh, process modeling technologies uh, that we're going to um, quickly uh, talk about, uh, process mining uh, and task mining. Process mining uh, works by collecting data that is generated by business applications. Events are taken from uh, uh, event logs uh, of uh, various core business systems. The process mining tools uh, can use the data to create a visual representation uh, of the process, uh, both the expected process as well as all the real-world exceptions uh, and deviations uh, from that process. For this reason, uh, process mining tools are best suited for processes that are already highly automated uh, and where most uh, of the work is done using uh, uh, business applications. Also, process mining tools work best with established uh, ERP uh, platforms uh, and, and CRM systems. Uh, it takes longer to train a process mining tool to work with custom applications. In fact, much of the competition between providers uh, in the space uh, is about uh, who offers more connectors to various established uh, uh, software systems. How is process mining uh, used? Uh, it is used to understand uh, uh, what is happening inside a process. Uh, it is used uh, to optimize uh, processes, um, uh, and it is used to make sure that processes, uh, once they have been optimized and streamlined, uh, uh, continue to be in compliance uh, with the established rules. Another application, probably an intended application of process mining, is uh, it helps migration between core uh, business systems uh, because it can help uh, uncover all of the business rules uh, and all, all of the uh, scenarios uh, that the target system needs to support. Task mining, it's also called process discovery, uh, works by actually capturing actions that people perform on a computer. Uh, task mining software collects actions uh, performed by multiple workers and uses AI uh, to build a map and a visual representation of a process. Visualization uh, of the process helps you identify automation opportunities uh, and the tool can actually generate uh, an automated process. Uh, so some of the RPA vendors, uh, they're now offering tools um, that uh, can not only learn how a process works, but they can uh, actually generate an, an automated process. Um, uh, Automation Anywhere, one of the leading RPA vendors, has a, a tool like that. It's called Discovery Bot. Uh, so in a way, it is, uh, it is a bot uh, that can create other bots. Briefly, how um, the tool from Automation Anywhere works, a process analyst creates a discovery project uh, 
uh, invites uh, in, uh, workers to participate in um, in the project. Uh, workers start uh, to record their actions in a particular process on their computers. Uh, they can annotate steps uh, in the process, and then um, all these multiple recordings are combined uh, and create an aggregate uh, visualization of a process. Uh, this allows a process analysts to identify automation opportunities and then uh, prioritize them for implementation uh, and then actually to generate a robot. This concludes our tour of different automation technologies. I will now turn it over to Brian uh, to talk about how to get started uh, and how to scale intelligent automation uh, in an organization. Uh, Brian, it's all yours. Thanks, Alex. So whether or not you're familiar with these foregoing technologies, at this point, you can likely imagine how they might apply to business or technology problems you're currently facing. If you began researching and thinking about intelligent automation solutions, you would make some progress by identifying pain points to alleviate and defining the scope for uh, some initial project or, or pilot. And a pilot may be a single project or a set of related projects, but this is a natural place to start. Now, starting a pilot already requires some momentum. Then scaling further requires commitment and buy-in from business leadership and intentional planning. In this context, intelligent automation is a longer-term process your business is engaged in as much or more so than it is a description of how a set of tools are applied to streamline its activities. So here's a typical progression. As we've seen, ado the adoption of intelligent automation technologies typically begins with that pilot. A pilot focuses on a single process. It establishes standards for metrics, practices for iterating and incrementally improving the situation and setting patterns of operation. A pilot is equally an opportunity to evaluate and compare automation tools and implementation alternatives. Because the pilot does benefit from a momentum boost, many organizations seek partnerships with automation RPA vendors and service providers to provide guidance and best practices to jumpstart the process. So in deploying the, the pilot, the basic operations are typically owned by IT, while the continuing iterations, assessment and learning and, and process evolution are owned and, and led by analysts and business stakeholders. So an IT's intelligent automation capability does not sit comfortably within IT or within a single department or a business unit. Automating more and more processes on a product to product, team to team, piecemeal basis generally will fail to deliver the full value of this. So with the outcomes of the pilot product in hand, its lessons and the experience gained from optimizing it, driven by measurements, the pilot team can present and demonstrate to business leaders the value of the automation approach. And that transitions to with some leadership buy-in, this intelligent automation effort can begin to transition from a pilot to a corporate initiative led by the business and executed by a center of uh, by a center of excellence. The COE is responsible for aligning senior stakeholders across business units, IT and HR, while it gathers potential automation opportunities, prioritizes them, provides guidance, or even implements solutions across the organization. And finally, as more processes benefit from intelligent automation, the COE can expand to include additional stakeholders, govern a group of, C of centers of excellence in some federated model. But here, Let's pause and consider an example and a problem and a solution. Late in 2017 and into 2018, NHS Lothian began a pilot at Western General in Edinburgh that involved attendant RPA robots and machine learning models to improve their gastroenterology referral triage process. The pilot was rolled out across six consultant gastroenterologists who previously were triaging around 30 to 40 GP referrals a day. Of these usual referrals, over 30% of them were classified as urgent suspected cancer. During the pilot, uh, an internal steering board directed the, the, the effort, and they initially began by considering other specialties as well as before aligning on gastroenterology. The specialty had seen a 20% increase in referrals since 2015, and this resulted in a 12-week average waiting time for patients to be seen by a specialist, with some waiting up to 52 weeks or more. They evaluated contributing factors to these wait times and found that improving the triage process would significantly address the problem. Prior to the pilot, a GP would submit an electronic referral to the specialist. The specialist would evaluate the referral to decide whether a patient should be sent to a clinic or taken in for testing, such as an endoscopy. Even this step could take around two days to render a decision. They comprehended the scope of the problem by analyzing over 25,000 GP referral letters over a four-year period 
And that an analysis showed that their triage process was complex with over 120 outcome permutations, with a high variability in how triage decisions were made. This variability was manifest as they had a group of specialists effectively retriage cases to see how well those decisions aligned with the previous when the significant percentages did not match. Even when facing this potentially error-prone process and the proposed solution included a set of two RPA robots and two AI models, as a proof of concept, an, L an NLP model was trained on previous referral data to prove that it was possible to extract the right structure to enable these classifier models to make urgency and outcome predictions. Into the pilot, the two AI models were one for classifying patient referrals as urgent suspected cancer, urgent or routine, and the other for predicting appropriate triage outcome, whether the patient should be sent to a clinic, taken in for a colonoscopy, endoscopy, both or another test. The two robots were responsible for pulling the patient medical records and booking appointments based on the model predictions. Um, for those interested, the classifiers were developed incrementally by iterative experiments where the analysts began, began with traditional machine learning algorithms, namely support vector machine, random forest, and k nearest neighbor approaches before moving on to training a convolutional neural network and comparing the baselines for each. So the pilot itself was conducted such that the automated triage process first ran in a shadow mode while additional training data was collected, followed by a period of allowing the automation solution to triage a cohort of these urgent suspected cancer referrals subject to clinical or risk and management considerations. And starting this year, when the process went live for 50% of their target cohort, after two years of the pilot period, the solution also includes a real-time analytics dashboard that reflects referral patterns and a UI for humans to assist the RPA robots when the auto triage decisions are in doubt. The referral turnaround, even with this fraction of referrals processed, that 50%, has reduced about 15% against their average two-week wait targets. So NHS Lothian has next plans to expand this approach to triage referrals for breast cancer patients. From this case, you can see some ex an example of just how a pilot begins, how its conditions are set, and how it proceeds. So while this process is not always precisely the same, it's the, the beginning, it typically proceeds by some st these stages of qualification, quantification, and then delivery. The activities that fall under this qualification stage might start with some motivated team in a single department has some pain points. Members of leadership see problems like this measurable gap in time to referral within this health system. And in, in, in this system, in this case, they, they then formed a group to examine these referral workflows before creating that steering board. They still selected owners of the process, met to review their workflows, determine prioritization and selection criteria, used existing tools and analytics to assess those workflows, and selected the starting case. Quantification may begin before qualification is complete when assessing steps to automate using existing analytics, but, the, but this stage properly begins when new measurements are taken to validate the, that process selection. So this is the stage when years of referral documents were processed and re-triaged to, to measure the variability of urgency and outcome decisions, as well as confirm the viability of, for automating of that, of that choice. During the quantification, so the working group or or their set of groups, they should define the meaning of success and the key performance indicators to measure that success against. These will be revised as the pilot progresses, but they're important to set prior to development. The delivery stage is the product or product development stage. So an automation solution that includes developing RPA robots or advising business processes, yeah, that still involves the common stages of software development. In particular, this, this development cycle should resemble agile product development, where your product is the process. Your product is the process and not just the components you might be developing. So that means we analyze first, evaluate the feasibility of automating the process, discover the business and technical constraints, risks, and, and document those assumptions. We design based on those constraints and assumptions, develop and test the automated process and components deploy them, integrating them as appropriate into production, either side by side or replacing existing process um, piece by piece, stabilizing by monitoring performance, and optimizing, refining, and repeating the cycle. So not to, to put too fine a point on it, but it's worth emphasizing. As we saw with the triage case and the pilot period of years, 
during the intelligent triage, agents were regularly retrained and optimized given, given the nature of the application and the serious importance of accurately predicting the, the urgency status and the outcomes. The triage process becomes the product. And the approach, though perhaps not the models themselves, can be applied to, to, by other services, such as mammography or cardiology. The process can improve through the feedback given by specialists that interact with it. So in this respect, it's like product development. Its users are the specialists, and they provide the feedback. And this is a, and so this looks an awful lot like a modified lean product development cycle where the process is swapped for product. So looking beyond the pilot. If you're looking to expand the scope of your pilot or evaluating how to move on to automating more processes, it'll be tempting to use your deployed, if you have them, RPA or BPM platforms or add more robots to solve for manual cases in the near term. But taking a process as is, as Alex had mentioned, and keeping the interactive steps in, in place is what you might do as part of a POC to demonstrate the place in your environment of some tool set. Even with a process that involves a single person the gains from automating it will come when you introduce a mix of interactive as well as backend modifications. The process will change. So for example, what may, maybe the GP referrals, they, do, they won't, wouldn't require a separate entry form submission like they do now to make sure that they're in um, digitized form to be processed. If you have a multi-person workflow to automate, you'll find it will involve even more backend integrations and development. And for those high volume mission critical processes, it will be likely optimal to automate those nearly exclusively in backend systems using direct integrations and an RPA robot may not, or these kinds of low code so solutions may turn out to be um, less than ideal. So while gesturing toward moving beyond a pilot, we'd like to share some, some key lessons learned from recent years as an intel intelligent automation has, has grown. So integrations with RPA can be brittle and they can be more brittle than integrations via APIs. But because, and this, because the, the virtue of an RPA robot is that it uses the UI, it uses a UI, and the downside is that it uses an, a UI. The UI is potentially subject to changing conditions and unexpected behavior, unlike it, well, an API is subject, subject to change, it's typically more stable and, and can handle um, fault, is a bit more fault tolerant, typically. Avoid automating processes as is. Again, the manual steps may come from convenience, but if more steps are automated, Taken in the abstract, they may be different. Take advantage of the opportunity to improve the overall shape of the process. Maybe you, maybe now you send a fax to print and communicating something as part of a workflow and automating the following step may be suboptimal when applying AI to a scan of the fax instead of keeping the document flow digital. Next, would you observe and consult with the staff performing the work? So you talk to the SMEs, but also consult staff, other affected staff like nurses or administrative support. They usually have important insights, especially with respect to exceptions, and decompose the process steps carefully and log them. A human may be doing many steps at once. Automate them as many. Finally, consider consulting automation experts instead of self-evaluating and purchasing tools just on your own. So take advantage of the momentum boost with that third-party jumpstart. Your organization will build the muscle over time and should and take ownership of it, but don't worry about getting there in order to start and plan to communicate the goals of an automation program within your organization. People may be concerned how automation affects their work now and in the future, and you should read it, reach out to them, describe the program's goals and how it's going to improve their effectiveness. And that brings us to step, stepping fully beyond it. And after a pilot and some successful automation efforts, you've been wondering why would you set up a center of, of excellence? And I mentioned that intelligent automation is a longer term concern for a business and that requires strategy. And a common approach to leading an adoption effort is to establish the COE. And a COE is, is enabled by a corporate initiative, by full buy-in, by full leadership buy-in. So the, the COE is a group of leaders and experts, and it's often a, a, an owner who is a senior business stakeholder, who has senior, deci senior decision-making authority, senior representatives from business units to reflect the priorities of those business units, and they can propagate governance decisions, representatives from IT, HR, or compliance, so especially for representing the interests of um, employees affected by automation and provide guidance on prioritization and impacting the assessment on operations. And finally, all of whom will provide guidance and best practices that automation strategy 
development support through functional groups. Maybe they're attached architects to analysts, developers, data scientists, and engineers. They, this group should present an operation model, um, performance standards, and evangelize for the automation technology, for the adoption of those automation technologies. It's important to see the COE as a cross function, as cross functional and not another silo. So finally, the final piece that I'll share is about expanding the COE. I mean, after, after years of, of maturing and your automation practices run throughout your organization, it may be necessary to expand the central COE and expand, enhance a structure with additional stakeholders, maybe a separate evangelist role, more functional teams and a steering committee. And you might couple this with establishing COEs within individual business units that will be coordinated or orchestrated by the central COE. In the triage case, there may be a medical COE a radiology COE, an emergency COE, a surgery COE, and, and on and on, and those auto, and as automation is propagated throughout the organizations. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I really appreciate all the efforts you made in, in pulling this webinar together. I'm Bob Lee Poltz, Chief Business Development Officer at Data Art. Thank you again and have a great day.